Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Trust and Identity Information Session. My name is Kerry Moore, and I'm from the AAF, and I will be your host for today. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge country. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Australian Access Federation acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd also personally like to acknowledge the Kaurna people from where I am based on the Adelaide Plains. In today's session, we will discuss the importance of trust and identity for national research infrastructure and hear from our AF team, Heath Marks, our CEO, Alina Philippi, our Chief Operating Officer, Sarah Nisbet, our Head of E-Research, Sarah Thomas and Nick Rosso, our E-Research Portfolio Managers, and Fahame Amanjame, our E-Research Analyst. We will also be hearing from a variety of fantastic guest speakers who will discuss trust and identity, highlight their experience and why it's important to them and the benefits it has to offer. They include Dr. David Kelsey from the UK Science and Technology Facilities Council and co-chair of the Aegis Policy Working Group. Dr. Stephen Manos from the Australian Biocommons and their Associate Director Cyber Infrastructure. Mark Gray from Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre and Head of Strategic Partnerships. And Peter Bajaya from the National Imaging Facility, Senior Manager for Data Coordination. Carl Selman, Flinders University Chief Information and Security Officer and Chair of AHEX, the Australasian Higher Education Cybersecurity Service. In terms of housekeeping, we are recording this session and if you have any questions, please post them and we will discuss them at the end, except for David Kelsey, who is joining us from the UK and he will be answering any questions directly after his presentation. If we don't get to answer all of your questions today, we will be in contact with you after the session. And now we'll run a short message from our CEO, Heath Marks, who talks about the AAF. I'm Heath Marks, the CEO of the Australian Access Federation, also known as the AAF. We are transforming Australia's research, teaching and learning communities by delivering innovative technology solutions that provide secure access to digital resources and infrastructure across the entire ecosystem. Trust and identity is what we do. We are the experts in this space with a long history of delivering services and solutions for the sector. Since 2009, we have played a vital role in the Australian e-research infrastructure landscape. We are the national capability delivering trust and identity services for NCRIS. We enable secure connection and collaboration between education and research institutions, both locally and internationally. The National Identity Federation that AAF operates is part of a global network of over 87 federations and enables over 4 million authentications annually. Today, the AAF connects 103 organisations and enables access to over 700 national and international services that support teaching, learning and research. We are also the ORCID Consortium Lead for Australia. ORCID is a unique and free identifier for researchers to manage and connect their research outputs. As the ORCID Consortium Lead, we work with institutions to integrate ORCID with their systems and easily connect researchers with their publications, grants and organisation affiliations. We have been co-designing trust and identity solutions for national research infrastructure for over a decade. This has seen us work closely with a number of leading partners such as CSIRO, Atlas of Living Australia, Australian Biocommons, Oran, and the ARDC. Together, this makes us Australia's leading expert in trust and identity for research. In 2021, the National Research Infrastructure Roadmap identified the need for a system-wide approach to trust and identity. AAF, as trust and identity experts, are working with national capabilities to co-design solutions that enhance Australia's research infrastructure. Trust and identity solutions enable greater advances in research knowledge and research impact. It also protects research through enhanced cybersecurity. We see the future as a connected national research system, one that removes silos, 
opens up access to research knowledge and creates greater advances for Australian researchers and industry. Together, we will create a system-wide approach for trust and identity, so Australia is globally aligned and our research and industry lead the future. And now I'd like to introduce Sarah Nisbet, the AAF's Head of eResearch, to speak about trust and identity for national research infrastructure. Wonderful. Thanks, Kerry. And a big thanks to our audience for joining us today so that we can talk to you about some of the exciting new work that we're doing to improve and simplify access to Australia's research infrastructure. Uh, as Kerry mentioned, I'm the Head of eResearch at the AAF and I'm leading the extension of our trust and identity capability into research, industry and government. Uh, for those of you who do know me, I have a long history of working uh, with other NRI and I've been working in the e-research landscape since 2009. Um, so trust and identity underpins every aspect of modern research. Our vision is to create a more researcher-centric NRI ecosystem that is more connected and secure. We're building a trust and identity framework that includes policy and technology, allowing researchers to enjoy a more cohesive network of services. Through one username and password, they will be able to seamlessly access multiple services, think sequences, supercomputers, data repositories, all sharing a common understanding of a user's identity. We see a more connected future where research, industry and government can easily collaborate, enabling new advances in research and translation. So why trust and identity now? So we're all engaging online more than ever before. And with so many digital services available, there's a need to be able to verify who we are in trusted and safe environments when accessing our banking, government or health services online. And this holds just as true for our research services. So in Australia, we're seeing a push from the federal government towards a more connected ecosystem of digital services, providing us with a more secure privacy enhancing and seamless user experience. Um, and the, the government's data digital strategy states that its vision is to deliver simple, secure uh, and connected public services for all people and businesses through world-class data and digital capabilities. Internationally, we've seen the adoption of trust and identity principles for research infrastructure with the development of the ARC blueprint, which we'll hear a lot more about from our next speaker. And locally, in the 2021 um, National Research Infrastructure Roadmap, uh, that's identified trust and identity as being critical to enable a step change in our national digital research infrastructure strategy. Uh, it also points to trust and identity as being the key enabler in achieving a more seamless, globally connected and cyber secure NRI ecosystem for our researchers. So through the trust and identity capability, we've identified four main benefits to researchers, and that is easier access to national research infrastructure, better access to international research infrastructure and collaborations, better industry collaboration, and a safer and more secure national research ecosystem through cybersecurity best practice. So based on these benefits, our trust and identity strategy is underpinned by a number of strategic drivers, including creating that more researcher-centric NRI ecosystem, where researchers are able to move seamlessly between infrastructures and building really high quality infrastructure that supports the access to the tools, services, and importantly, the skills uh, that researchers need to do their work. But the one that I really wanna focus in on today is the one about addressing national, national challenges. And this is about deploying trust and identity solutions in response to complex problems. For example, reducing disease, food security, climate change, biodiversity loss. We wanna work directly with research communities to build solutions in response to these problems. And that's why our collaborations with the Biocommons, NIF and Pawsey and others are so important to us. Rather than just providing domain agnostic technology, we're enabling transformational change through collaboration and partnership. So with our national framework, we're not starting from scratch. It is informed by international best practice. And I'll hand back to Kerry now to introduce our next speaker, David Kelsey, who will talk more about the international federated identity landscape 
and how the blueprint is evolving to meet the needs of the current research communities. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you, Sarah. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. David Kelsey, who is very kindly joining us live from the UK. David is head of the computing group in particle physics at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, based near Oxford. He is an experimental particle physicist by background and now concentrates on IT and has been working in security, trust and identity for research for more than 20 years. He has held leadership roles in several e-infrastructures, including UK Grid PP, CERN, EGI and EOSC. He was also a founding member of several global activities coordinating security, trust and identity, including IGTF, FIM4R and WISE. He worked on policy activities in the ARC projects from 2015 to 2019 and co-chairs the Policy Working Group for Aegis. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you, Kerry, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to you and your colleagues for inviting me to speak to you today about ARC and Aegis. So next slide, please. So this is very much a lightning talk there's not much time to go into any detail. I just want to cover a number of topics and then the material will be available for you offline or we can uh, follow up on things um, afterwards in Q&A or afterwards. So I will talk about fim for r that started first back in 2011, leading to the ARC projects starting in 2015, then talk about Aegis and then uh, talk about uh, the future and some conclusions. Um, and many apologies for the super fast view and thanks to uh, my colleagues for use of their slides. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, the Federated Identity Management for Research vision that we stated in the in paper version number two, that every researcher is entitled to focus on their work, not to be impeded by obstacles, nor required to understand any of the technical details of the infrastructure, and just get the, let them to get on with their, their work accessing the research, research services. And so everything that we've pushed for in FIM4R for is on that basis. Next slide. So what, what is Federated Identity Management for Research? Um, we First of all, here are the two papers that we, uh, we published, 12 and then 2018. Uh, the links are there and there's the group that uh, finalized the draft in 2018 at the uh, TNC conference in uh, Trondheim in Norway that year. Next slide. So the uh, fim for our communities, we represent volunteer research communities who were willing to join into the, uh, the exercise. And as you see there, there's a wide range of arts and humanities, linguistics, bioscience, um, the physics, astronomy, and high energy physics, etc. And if you belong to a research community that's not in there, we didn't exclude you for any reason. It's just that we didn't manage to make contact with you. So anybody who wants to join in, it's an open organization, please join us and help us develop. We are continuing to meet and developing things for the future. Next slide, please. So authentication and authorization for research collaboration, ARC, the FIM for our work and other studies in the Europe in Europe persuaded the European Commission to fund these projects. So we had two times two years, each with the same set of 25 partners taking forward the ideas that uh, had come out of there and looking at what um, existing communities were actually doing. And there's a, there's a link there to a, a video which is still available, I believe, and um, is a, a good introduction of what ARC is all about. Next slide, please. So one of the fundamental things that we experienced very early on was that the EDUGAIN Global Interfederation for Research and Education, um, of which the uh, AAF is, is a member, um, works very well for many of the services, the SPs in the universities and the identity providers. But for research communities, it was often difficult or impossible because they were not actually legal entities or what have you to sign contracts and join federations. And so they wanted to, many of the research communities decided it was easier to join EduGain through this proxy and identity. So this proxy in the middle here between the uh, the, the ready, uh, the brownie, orangey, uh, whatever the color is, uh, research project there on the left, 
it, it appears to be an IDP that hides all the complexity of the research of the um, identity federation behind that. And then to the edu game world it appears to be a single service provider and hides the complexity of all the services. And we found this to be an extremely useful architecture. And that's what the ARC blueprint architecture is based on. Next slide, please. So the ARC results coming out of the four years of work that we did, we had the technical blueprint architecture showing how to actually use this proxy and join all the various components together, a large number of guidelines and recommendations, and some policy frameworks and the policy development kits to actually allow people to, to put the policy requirements together to actually join the research community into the, uh, the global Edugain Interfederation. Next slide, please. So Aegis, the ARC engagement group for infrastructures was actually started halfway through the ARC projects in 2017. As, it, uh, um, as we realized that we needed something that was sustainable beyond the end of the project that was actually gonna take things forward after ARC had finished and was going to allow the various infrastructures to work together um, with their representatives as a communication channel between them and the infrastructure providers um, a, a way of promoting a consistent vision and facilitating future activities so that you know adoption and implementation of harmonized solutions would actually uh, uh, actually work and this has been extremely useful beyond the end of the art project next slide please and so there are two classes of membership in Aegis. There are the full members that are the, and there's a list there of the full members, um, the current full members. So this is a um, infrastructures and other organizations who are already operating an authentication authorization infrastructure consistent with the art blueprint architecture and the guidelines. Um, and they get to vote on the, uh, the new documents and endorse them and, and they agree to actually implement them and their sort of implementation is tracked by the Aegis organization. But then there are many observers as well who are interested in following the guidelines and the blueprint architecture or in the process of implementing them. And uh, there's a long list there, but you, importantly, you'll notice that the Australian Access Federation is one of the observers there. So that's your important route in you as the research communities in in Australia to actually feed in your requirements, things that don't work, feedback, and uh, let us develop and take things forward. Next slide, please. So another activity that maintained the uh, sustainability of the funding afterwards were the, the European Union Geant projects, GN4 and GN5. And in there, the trust and identity activities there, there's a subtask called Enabling Communi Communities, ENCO, where there are funded members of the staff who are able to participate in Aegis to take forward um, work, particularly in the areas of trust and policy and documentation and support. And here you see a picture of the blueprint architecture. And again, I don't have time to go through any of the details, but you see the user, the users at the top and the services at the bottom linked together by this proxy. And you notice that one of the services can be a proxy in itself. And we've seen that in a growing number of cases that the proxies are nested so one is run by the infrastructure, one run by the community, perhaps run by other entities. Next slide, please. And one of the things that we actually did in Giant Enco was to actually produce this getting started page and the link, the short um, URL there, edu.nl, points to that detail, which takes you through and points you at the appropriate guidance and, and help there. And that it, of course, to, you will also get good support from the trust and identity team in AAF as well as and I'm sure they they will be your first point of call but if you want to know more there it is next slide please so what about the future we've got an arc 3 project which we actually called arc tree technical revision to enhance effectiveness this was submitted to the european commission earlier this year has successfully gone through the review process and so we are now in contract negotiation with the commission but because that negotiation is not completed i don't list the members or state how much money we're getting or anything but uh, it is likely to run for two years starting early next year and the objectives there include 
several things, interoperability requirements, new requirements taking into account what's changed since 2019, new technical and policy guidelines, expanding the number of research communities, um, aligning strategies, and producing a compendium and recommendations. We need to uh, target small and medium research communities, simplifying the ARC PDK, establishing new trust in interoperability. And here, fim for r is seen as a continuing important place for research communities to, to come in. So all of the discussions here, even though the project is closed, all of the discussions will be held in open forum. forum and I, uh, I invite you and your colleagues to join in fim for r et cetera, and feed in your experiences of using the ARC blueprint and where things don't work well, let's try and improve them together. Next slide, please. So this is uh, my summary. This is the end. So uh, the outputs from ARC and ARC2 have been very successfully used in many research infrastructures, enabling more efficient use of IT researches. The Aegis has been an important area for maintaining and developing the technical aspects and taking it forward. And if and where or Confidently, when the ARC tree project is finally approved, we will build on this and update all aspects. I said that AAF is an observer in Aegis. That's an important route in for Australia as a research community. Um, and fim for r is important, and we will be holding the next uh, one full day meeting in Copenhagen in Denmark at the end of January next year. Um, and so anybody who wants to join there is very welcome to join us. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kerry. Oh, the next slide, just uh, there is a slide here of information. So there's various pointers and things that you can find out, find out more. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. That was a really interesting outline of Federation and Aegis. And now I'd like to open to the floor. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to put to David before he, um, might head off for the rest of the session. I will try to stay with you for the whole session. Okay. <laughs> so if you think of them, you have an opportunity to put it in the <laughs> chat later as well. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, and, and obviously if there are questions afterwards, put them in the chat and we'll 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 come back to the questions later as well. Thanks. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing anything um, pop in. It might be, um, please feel free to do so. All right, well, um, let's head on to the next session now. Uh, thank you very much, David, that was great. Um, for the, now for this next session, I'd like to hand over to the AF's Trust and Identity Team, to Sarah Thomas, Nick Rosso and Fahame. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. And thank you once again, David, for providing that great overview of the fim for r Aegis and the ARC Blueprint. The AAF is building on the ARC Blueprint architecture to create a system-wide trust and identity framework for the Australian national research infrastructure. Our approach consists of three elements. One, we are co-designing a common approach to access and authentication infrastructure for collaborative research environments. The framework consists of both policy and technology solutions. Two, to set the foundation for the capability, we are also looking at activities around the periphery of the framework, without which the project would not succeed or be sustainable. This includes technology, skills development, and cybersecurity. As part of this activity, we have released a survey to gain a baseline understanding of trust and identity in the community. A link to this survey will be available at the end of the webinar. And finally, three, testing the framework components in manageable bite-sized projects to ensure longevity of partner relationships. I'll now hand over to Nick to talk through these components. Thanks, Kerry, um, and thanks, Sarah, for that. So David spoke about a community, and Sarah earlier mentioned the collaborative research environments. So today I'd like to quickly show what it is that we mean when we say these terms. A traditional research environment might look something like this, where a research project utilizes services from multiple organizations. And bear in mind, this is a, a really overly simplified diagram. Uh, later on, Steve will show you a real life diagram when he talks about um, his project, and it will actually show the complexity of the research infrastructure landscape. So in a traditional research environment, a 
the user management is performed at each service. So users may be required to register for an account at each endpoint. Authentication is managed locally. So this also could be done through the AAF or other federated logins. However, even if federated logins are used, there is still no shared understanding of who a user is between the services. Authorization is also managed locally at each service. So any data that needs to be migrated from one service to the next, it's done through the user downloading and re-uploading that data. Now, obviously this can introduce issues such as versioning control problems, time wastage, and even increased potential security and privacy concerns. So in a collaborative research environment, we introduced the concept of a central source of truth for authentication and authorization, the trust and identity service. This gives users a single sign-on for all services in the collaboration. And with a bit of work through the end services, it enables data to be shared from one service to another without passing through the user's desktop. Another critical time saving is adding or removing user access or even auditing user access is all done through the central trust and identity service. So now that we've briefly shown what a collaborative research environment is, I thought we'd take another very brief look at what the framework is. And remember, we're not starting from scratch. We're building on the work already done in Europe through what David spoke about this morning. So our goal is to build a standard approach to trust and identity for national research infrastructures that is interoperable with international research infrastructure. Historically, every platform or service has built their own trust and identity solutions in isolation. And while we've seen many facilities use the existing federation for authentication, there is yet to be a consistent approach to trust and identity across services or across organizational boundaries. But the framework is more than just a technical blueprint for authentication and authorization. There is a level of trust building that is important to consider when connecting users to services across organizational boundaries. So we purposely called the framework the trust and identity framework because there are two major components. The trust component is made up of the policy development kit, which is designed to build trust, not only between end users and service providers, but also between service providing organizations operating within the research environment. So today I'd like to dig a little deeper into the policy development kit to show how it builds trust and how we are taking a co-design approach to refine these policies and to make sure that they're fit for the Australian legislative landscape. So you can see on the screen here, the eight different policies that have been developed in this kit. So these policies are not designed to replace the existing service level policies, but to complement them. These policies are important for consideration where collaborative research environments are being developed because collaboration is easier if we all have the same starting point or the same understanding. So infrastructure providers will benefit from a shared understanding of how security incidents are handled. And they will also benefit from a shared understanding of who their users are, where they're coming from, and what they're doing. This will have a positive flow on effect to enable them to track the impact of their infrastructure. And users will benefit from an understanding of what the standard level of privacy they can expect is in the collaborative research environment or the standard approach to acceptable use across these platforms. To achieve this shared understanding, the IAF is taking a co-design approach to policy development. Again, we're not starting from scratch. The policy development kit is a great place to start and we've initiated a policy working group, which we hope will have a good representation from across NCRIS facilities and supporting organizations. The kit has a range of discussion starter questions to ensure that the adopting collaborations arrive at a shared understanding of the key concepts covered by the policies. The working group will consider these starter topics and continue to build the policy framework to, a to, sorry, to suit the Australian landscape. If you want to find out more about these policy working groups, jump onto the AAF website and follow the links to the trust and identity page.
Thank you, Nick. For the incubators, our goal is to test all elements of the framework and from these learnings evolve the framework to ensure it meets the Australian research community requirements. The project board has endorsed a due diligence framework for selection of these incubators. You will find the selection principles listed on the screen. Once an incubator is approved, the AAF and the incubator partners will co-design a trust and identity solution. AAF has developed operating principles for the incubators, and I wanted to go through these principles in a little more detail. Exploratory. We are building cutting edge trust and identity solutions. The core value of this principle is innovation. Co-designed. We want to work with our partners to develop trust and identity solutions that will meet their needs. We want to ensure that those in our research community benefit from best practice trust and identity. Translatable. This principle speaks to the fact that we are building a common approach to trust and identity. So we want to be able to reuse what we are doing in each incubator to benefit other partners. And this is expressed again in the process diagram to the right. Driven by vision. This principle is about ensuring there is a clear purpose for the incubator with smart goals attached. Just the beginning. We want to break the framework into small, manageable projects. We like to say that we are building decade or long partnerships and the incubator is just the beginning of this partnership. And the dots at the bottom, co-design underpins all of AAF's activities. This gives our partners an opportunity to include other principles. AAF is keen to ensure that our incubators address grand challenges, such as a centre of excellence or a cooperative research centre sets out to achieve. We want to ensure that the solutions deployed through these incubators harness the entirety of the Australian research infrastructure sector, creating not only an impactful collaboration across the NRI landscape, but co-designing solutions with research communities with these national challenges in mind. I will now hand over to my colleague, Far, who will explain in more detail this co-design approach. Thank you, Far. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you everyone for attending this session today. As Sarah mentioned, uh, we are using co-design principles and toolbox to ensure that the true, the life cycle of incubators, all stakeholders are kept engaged. But what is exactly co-design? There are a different definition of co-design. Uh, however, all these definitions uh, agree on some principles that include openness, participatory, and iterative nature of co-design. Co-design is more like a process or mindset that combines both generative and exploratory research approaches to define a problem and also provide a solution, design a solution for that problem. How we are doing the co-design there is not exactly a methodology or step-by-step -step guideline on how to do co-design. Ideally, it includes an iterative cycle of four main phases, which include understanding what's the problem, defining potential solutions, developing those solutions, testing, and the feedback loop. It is cyclic, and the partners that are involved in this uh, co-design process can move between these phases and or just play a major role in one of those um, phases. Who is going to be involved in the co-design process? Um, we want the representatives from the critical groups of our stakeholders to be involved, the people who are likely to be impacted uh, mostly with the solution or benefit from this solution, such as researchers or research facilities, um, they're gonna be involved either directly or indirectly. So depending to their availability, uh, we will apply the right methods to facilitate the right level of engagement for our uh, partners in co-design. To do that, we use a toolbox, a co-design toolbox, which includes sets of tools that can be used to engage the stakeholders based on the context and the constraints that we have, and also create the best outcomes out of it. These tools can vary in different stages of design. Uh, for example, we can use interviews in the discovery stage, uh, workshops, uh, co-design workshops in the design phase, pilot studies and surveys when you're doing the testing, 
and depending on the context and availability of the stakeholders, we adjust these methods and design the proper method of engagement in each phase of the co-design project. Uh, I will now hand over to Kerry to run the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, Nick and Far for outlining how trust and identity works across collaborative research environments and how we can build a common approach across national research infrastructure. I'd now like to share with you a short video by Dr. Stephen Manos from the Australian Biocommons who discusses the Threatened Species Initiative Demonstrative Project uh, and Building Trust and Identity. Hi everyone, thanks for having us here at the uh, AAF Trust and Identity session and I'm here to tell you about a project that we've been working on, which is the Threatened Species Initiative Demonstrative Project over the last year and a half or so. So we as the Biocommons um, engage with a number of communities nationally and one of our key ones over the last few years has been the Threatened Species Initiative. Uh, one of the things that researchers, conservationists, biologists, and other people who, broadly speaking, are not computational or analytics experts, need to conduct complex analysis. They need to be able to use um, tools to conduct their assembly and annotation um, of genomes of threatened species like the region Anaheda, Haneida, like koalas, and so on. So as a person or as a researcher who's part of the TSI consortium, we've engaged with TSI to develop a number of user stories, a number of scenarios which they want to be able to execute. So for example, that as a researcher, I want to be able to assemble a genome assembly in Galaxy Australia based on a sequence file and a transcript file um, from the BPA data portal. I want to be able to automatically annotate um, an assembled genome um, in Galaxy Australia. Um, I want to be able to ultimately share that annotated genome um, so I can improve that annotation um, and description of the genome um, in collaboration with my colleagues. And eventually, I want to be able to publish um, that draft assembly and annotation um, in the BPA data portal, So, which ultimately means that I can share those findings um, with the consortium nationally and internationally. One of the starting points for our work with the Threat and Species Initiative was this diagram that came from Carolyn Hoggs, who's the lead of that initiative, um, that consortium nationally. This, uh, to some of you, many of you, may look like a complicated picture, and certainly to Carolyn Hoggs it was. And unfortunately, this is the sort of picture that many researchers are left to their own devices to decipher and figure out nationally. What this picture describes is a range of different platforms that someone who needs to work uh, effectively in the um, in the threatened species space would need to would need to figure out themselves. They would need to understand where the data portal is, how to get to it. They would need to understand what Galaxy Australia is, how to get to it, um, how to get to other tools such as uh, those that are present on this thing called the TSI Conservation Genomics Hub. Um, what is Pawsey? How do I get there? Um, uh, and how do I utilize it? Um, there's the Australian Reference Genome Atlas, which provides a view of lots of different data resources. And ultimately, we need to be able to publish these uh, completed assembly uh, and annotation, uh, annotated genomes to AWS and other um, resources beyond, such as NCBI. From a researcher's perspective, this is a very, very complicated picture. Um, and the question is, how can we make this picture of research, which is what the reality is today, uh, much easier for particularly for people who aren't um, specialists in computing to handle. So we took on the challenge between Biocommons and AAF to try and resolve this for the Threatened Species Initiative. And what we decided to do initially was to simply say, let's try and solve an initial challenge of how do we get data from uh, that's sourced on the BPA, the Bioplatforms Australia data portal, raw sequence data, easily send it to Galaxy Australia um, and analyze that data. So how we formed up the challenge and how we formed up an initial picture of what we wanted to do was to simply say that as a researcher up here, you want to engage in this 
uh, or connect to this platform called the community portal, um, a single entry point. Um, and then from that point, you have access to everything you need in terms of documentation, in terms of links and the ability to access other services like the BioPlatforms data portal and Galaxy. And of course, the ability to, uh, to be able to send or ship data from the BPA data portal to Galaxy. The, um, the key thing to note here is that the community portal was a specific request from the Threat and Species Initiative because they really wanted a one-stop shop for all of this, um, all of this infrastructure. Part of the challenge is that everything is dispersed, documentation, access points, links are also dispersed. There's no um, uh, coherence amongst those various um, services and platforms. So this idea really also responded to not just making research easier, but subsequently, where does one start and making that starting point super easy and super straightforward. So why, why would we have a, a TSI service portal or a community hub? We're still working on the name. Um, well, it's a central online hub from which users can jump to different resources and services easily. So as I said, it's like TSI data on the BioPlatforms data portal. It's like uh, accessing assembly and annotation pipelines on Galaxy and also being able to access documentation and how-to guides and help as well. The technology we developed also provides single sign-on across these multiple services and some other nuances and some other important things like the management of membership and access rights to data and services because TSI is one of many different communities. There's genomics of Australian plants, there's Oz mammals, um, there's zero childhood cancer, there's many others and they will each have their own rights and privileges, different types of data and different styles and types of resources. And ultimately, having the TSI service portal is, as I said, just about making the process of research much easier. So we worked um, with AF to build a functional proof of concept, which, uh, which provided a, a single entry point. It provided researchers to access the BPA data, um, uh, the, the, ability, the ability for researchers to access the BPA data portal and to be able to search for their data of interest. Um, to be able to very easily transfer data from the BPA data portal to Galaxy, to then be able to log into Galaxy and process data. And then some other kind of extra uh, benefits around um, uh, outcomes around uh, being able to self-register um, uh, via a login of your choice, whether it's your institutional or Google, um, et cetera. And then to be able to also apply a request to TSI community membership. Um, and to be able to use that um, uh, that that identity um, or that account um, to be able to access these multiple services. And as a community manager, so as someone like Carolyn Hoggs, to be able to also initiate um, membership, to be able to say, I met Stephen Manos at a conference and I would like to invite him to be part of this online portal and being able to go through that process to invite them along and have them ultimately approved to be able to join that community. Uh, online. So I'm going to give you um, a live demonstration um, now, uh, and and this is really just focused around demo number one. And the user story behind demonstration number one is, as a user, I want to be able to easily find data and easily send it to Galaxy for analysis, all guided by clear documentation. We have some other demos, um, which I won't show today um, because we're limited on time, but it's around the user onboarding and access management. And the user stories there are that as a user, I want to be able to easily register for and get access to multiple services. And the second story is as a community manager, I need to be able to invite people to the platform and manage access in a straightforward and scalable way. I'm not going to show demo number two, but they are also things that we have worked on over the last, um, over the last year and a half. You can assume that for the demo right now, I've already done 2A. I've already um, registered for the service. Um, I've already uh, had my account and my registration approved. Um, and now I'm logging in for the first time and getting access to these multiple platforms. So I'm going to go ahead and um, start with, uh, with a, um, a window here um, on our Directus website. Directus is a, Directus is a CMS. 
uh, and this is the starting point. This is the, the, the single um, starting point that I described that was a requirement of our, uh, fr from, from the researchers we were working with in the Threaded Species Initiative. So here I um, have the opening page. I go sign in with CI Logon. I can select um, a number from a number of different identity providers. Here, I'm just gonna go with Google. Um, I'm gonna log in. And I've already signed in as my identity that I'm using for this demo called test member 584. So here's the view of the um, community portal or the service hub. Um, and I have access to various data sets. This is the region honey eater here. Um, so this is information that's being pulled down from the BPA data portal. Uh, I have access to various tools on Galaxy. Um, there are various user guides that I have access to that um, guide me through the process of running assemblage assemblers on, um, on Galaxy Australia. Uh, and um, I also have access, ongoing access to various services that are connected via this single sign-on methodology. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and access these services. Um, I'm going to click on the BPA data portal uh, link here. So you can see that this is going to a completely separate service now. Um, I click log in, uh, single sign on. Again, I'm going to log on via Google um, and it should just drop me into um, the these, um, these same um, identity. Um, so what's happened here is um, through the process of registering with the community hub, I've also had my uh my um identity um uh uh um created within within the bpa data portal um and i've also um similarly had my identity created within galaxy australia so i can go back here to the to the online portal i click on galaxy australia log in and i get logged in uh as as that user again so what I want to do now is I want to be able to um, to be able to go to uh, the next step is to go to the by platforms um, data uh, portal um, or even easier easier just go to um, uh, the the hub the service hub here and um, and which will automatically link me through to the region honey the data set uh, generally from here the process of in the past, the process of, of uh, getting data from the BPA data portal to something like Galaxy meant finding this data, downloading it. This here is a small data set. It's for test purposes, but they are much, much larger typically. Uh, and downloading these um, over wireless onto your laptop, getting it back into the BPA data, into Galaxy or other platforms for analysis can be a very uh, arduous and um, error prone process. So here, what we've done is decided to just make this super easy. You click access, you go send to Galaxy. It says resource sent to Galaxy. You move over to Galaxy and you can see that Galaxy is now in my history receiving that BAM file. So it is receiving that genome sequence uh, and it's done. And it is literally a one click process. And in the background, this is using the GF4GH DERS um, DRS standard to be able to link um uh those um those uh, two resources together and send this data across uh as i said this used to be a very complicated process it's now a much much simpler process i can now refer back to the science hub um here around um around finding guides uh and anything else i need to um to to proceed with my work from here I can simply say, well, I need to now run this workflow. I click on workflow here. This is the one I want to run against my data. This workflow is smart enough to know that my most recent upload, uh, uploaded sequence file is the one that it should use. Um, I click run uh, and then um, it will, uh, and then I click run workflow and then it will begin the process of indicating the various steps um, of this workflow. And as you can see here, uh it is quite a complicated um multi-step um workflow across various individual tools to make this assemblage happen so 
So just a quick recap, um, I've given you a, a quick demonstration and overview of uh, our work with the threatened species. Um, we have with the AEF developed um, a proof of concept of this idea of integrating these services. The aim was to really hide the complexity from researchers. Um, I should say that there's a lot of code and configuration and customization um, behind the scenes. We've endeavored to use standards like DRS and OIDC to make all this work extensible. Um, and I will, I guess, finish by saying that a lot of the work here requires not just start, uh, effort on the access and identity side, but also on the application side. And it's true to say that um, most of the effort has gone into uh, our work with CCAM, which is the technology uh, behind the data portal, but also Galaxy Australia, um, because those code bases need ex needed extensive modification to make um, these access and identity and also data insertion um, aspects um, work. And, um, and we've had some great successes lately because all of those changes have been, um, generally speaking, accepted upstream um, and particularly for Galaxy. Uh, and we, our next steps around this project are really to continue this work and aim to bring this idea of a service portal for not just the Threat and Species Initiative, but also for other communities as well. Um, into production in 2024 and beyond. So uh, thanks everyone for listening. We'd like to thank Stephen for putting together this presentation. And I'd also flag that we do have Nigel Ward here today who worked on this project and he will be able to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, and now we'll hear from Mark Gray, Head of Strategic Partnerships from the Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Kerry. So my name's Mark Gray. I'm the Head of Strategic Partnerships at Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre. And today I'm going to be talking to you. <clears throat> um, I'm going to mention our Trust and Identity Project, but what I'm going to be talking to you today is about why we want to do this thing. So uh, next slide, please. So PAUSI is, uh, if you don't know, a tier one supercomputing research center in Australia, one of two of the serving Australian researchers. Uh, we're located in uh, Wanjok Noongar land, um, the west coast of Australia. And we're here to provide uh, supercomputing research facilities to the Australian research community. And we're very interested in making sure that that infrastructure can work well with uh, for Australian researchers around Australia. Uh, so next slide, please. So you may be thinking, uh, if we're running a big supercomputer, uh, why do we care about uh, getting it to work? Surely we run just one computer. It's one great big thing. Uh, people log on to it. What's the difficulty? Uh, the difficulty is that that is not, I think, the future of Australian research infrastructure. The Australian research infrastructure of the future is not going to exist as one mammoth computer that everybody comes to. In fact, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest <coughs> that the kind of complexity that Steve Manos talked about in his talk, the researchers face when they come to using the computational infrastructure in Australia, in fact, globally, uh, is not going to get less complex. It may in fact get more complex as we go forwards. And with our trust and identity project with the AAF, we're trying to figure out how does that actually work directly with uh, the core computational infrastructure that provides our resource? How do researchers easily use our actual supercomputers uh, with, an, with an identity uh, system that will work. <clears throat> and an example of what this is going to look like is a project called the Square Kilometre Array that we are working with. The so Square Kilometre Array, um, if you're not familiar with it, is a large radio telescope that's being built in the Midwest of Western Australia and also in Southern Africa. When complete, it will likely be the largest science project on Earth, and it will certainly be the largest radio telescope on Earth, probably the largest radio telescope you can build on Earth. And in order to support a project of that scale, a large computational infrastructure is being created to support both process the data and do the science. And what that looks like right now, as I understand it, is uh, there's a core computational infrastructure that the S Square Kilometre Array Observatory will be operating in Western Australia that will do the core processing of that, of that data and then make it available to the regional centres around the world that will actually be part of the consortium doing the actual science with that data that's generated. And that data generated will be very large um, and require significant resources, both to process and store. 
in Australia, the SKA Regional Centre uh, will be doing the core uh, kind of science processing of that data, which is where scientists are getting access to that data, making it available to their collaborators. And then the Regional Centre and the SKAO were making that data available to a regional network of uh, regional centres around the world in the partner countries uh, that are part of the SKA. And they will be uh, collectively uh, making that computing data available to a very large number of researchers around the world. So what I'm describing here, of course, is a big distributed computing data storage problem that will require a significant effort in terms of trust and identity to function. And you can imagine there's lots of different moving parts of that. Uh, individual, quite different compute infrastructures and storage infrastructures that are going to be uh, created to form that system. Some of them will be running at Pawsey Civic Computing Research Center. Some of them will be running at other infrastructures around the world. They need to all work together with a single kind of uh, community um, and, and be easy to use for a bunch of researchers. And it's going to look a lot like the kind of bioinformatics workflow that Steve was showing in his previous talk. So if you go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> What does that look like in our region for researchers not doing SKA? Well, I think an example of that is our current developments in Singapore. So uh, NACC, the National Supercuting Center in Singapore, uh, recently announced the construction of a AI-focused supercomputer in Singapore, specifically just for um, the Sing Health system and um, providing AI researchers to the whole AI infrastructure to the uh, hospital research sector in Singapore and actually running in one of the in their general hospital. I think that a future in Australia for computational infrastructure is going to look increasingly like this, where we're building uh, kind of uh, domain specific computational infrastructure, as well as the core computational computational infrastructure at places like Pawsey. These systems are all going to have to work together, and the the nuts and bolts of that uh, that functionality is going to be deployed on the actual systems and have to work uh, kind of at a deeply integrated level with the compute to work. So, next slide, please. So, what does that look like in Australia? I think in Australia. What that looks like is large uh, tier one supercomputing research facilities like Pawsey and NCI, where we're building large compute infrastructures that can provide high level scaling for large computational simulations that have uh, high speed networking, uh, integrated science um, support into those systems. And there are places where we're also investing research effort in new technologies that are gonna advance uh, kind of a, the the boundaries of Australian research infrastructure, but there's also this very very important tier two compute infrastructure. And if I'll just put a plug in, uh, there's a uh, there's a session at e research coming up uh, next month, which will be actually discussing this exact topic, uh, this this tier two system, what it looks like. But I think it looks like the kind of infrastructure that's going to be built for the SKA. And it looks like the kind of infrastructure that NSCC is building in Singapore, where they're building domain-specific computational infrastructure to support specific requirements, requirements that may not be very easy to meet in the tier one infrastructure. And so these systems, but these systems are going to have to work together because it's the same pool of researchers that are using all this infrastructure. And they just like in Steve's example, need to be able to move data and their identity between infrastructures without having to hit roadblocks every single time they're trying to do things. And so what we're doing with AEF and the, and the Trust and Identity Project is trying to figure out how we get that working with our core compute so that that system can actually exist and be good for researchers and kind of not make their lives too horrible. Um, that's actually my talk, so thanks for the next slide. So. Thanks a lot uh, for listening to me talk. I'm kept it short because I've really just got one topic, which is how do we make this work and why do we do it? Um, I'll be around for questions later. Thanks very much. Back to you, Kerry. Thank you, Mark. That was a great outline of how you see the future of trust and identity for national research infrastructure and the importance of seamless connection. Okay, and now our next speaker for today is Peter Bajaya from the National Imaging Facility or NIF. Peter is NIF Senior Manager for National Data Coordination. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Kerry. It's great to be here. Can I have the next slide, please? So National Imaging Facility is Australia's advanced imaging network. We provide open access to flagship imaging equipment, expertise, tools, data and analysis on a national scale. We address Australia's strategic science and research priorities, 
for the benefit of Australian industry, but also very importantly to keep Australians healthy. A major focus of NIF is health and medical research, uh, but we also have considerable and growing in infrastructure and expertise supporting many other types of research. We're funded by NCRIS and state governments, and we uh, and we work with our partners, uh, uh, 14 partners. Next slide, please. So Australia's advanced imaging network is truly national. Uh, we're deployed in five states. We have 14 partners uh, doing very with uh, varying facilities uh, across Australia, small animal uh, imaging facilities, uh, large animal research, uh, radiochemistry facilities, preclinical and clinical imaging facilities, uh, and our partners work in brain research, um, uh, cancer research, whole body research. We've got over 100 instruments implemented nationally, many best of breed, and very importantly, we have 60 imaging experts deployed at our facilities who are helping researchers every day. Next slide, please. So from a data infrastructure across our NIF network, we have challenges and opportunities. Um, increasingly, multi-site data-centric projects are driving our requirements, and those projects themselves are becoming more complex. Um, especially in participant data management. Um, some of the dimensions are multi, multimodal scans, longitudinal studies, uh, diverse data sources, and highly analytical, often and more increasingly with, uh, that are AI enabled and with external and international collaborators. So, and looking at NIF's data infrastructure right now, it requires uplift. It's functional, but it's lacking scale. It's heterogeneous, it's siloed, it has limited support for integrating uh, and linking data. And often uh, our solutions for research community are project specific. And this is in the backdrop of increasing cyber breaches uh, internationally. So from the opportunities front, and there are a lot, NIF's uniquely positioned to create impactful data sets through our data partnerships. And that's a strategic focus for us. And there's an opportunity to create a single touch point service for our research community. There's opportunity for a step change to participant data management through technology integration. And uh, there's a great opportunity to leverage NCRIS standards, for example, through the ARDC best practice and capability, and an opportunity for identifying overlapping technologies that are implemented across other NRIs. Next slide, please. So the, let's talk about the tr uh, Trust and Identity part, part, Pathfinder project and why is NIF involved, wants to be involved. We, we think it's quite compelling. It provides harmonization and a central approach to user access management and puts access control back with the research data custodians. It simplifies user access management in complex decentralized multi-site research environments, which, which we have in spades uh, at, at, at NIF. Uh, it enables access for industry and external stakeholders, provides researcher with greater choice about who to trust and when to trust them. It's supportive with, uh, of ethics uh, approval applications and provides greater certainty when building technology integration solutions, as we've just talked about with Steve. So in terms of the NIF and AAF partnership, um, AAF authentication has been reliable and a great service for many years. It's very trusted. Um, this is an experiment, and uh, we know that and this incubator project won't get this done, fully done in terms of uh, trust and identity implementation. So we think an ongoing partnership with AAF is very important um, for long-term success and hopefully with increasing numbers of NRIs as well. In terms of our incubator project status, uh, our scope and objectives, we're still setting them. Uh, we're in that early phase. Uh, and our timelines are fluid, though we would like to deliver something this financial year. And I'd just like to share with you our current thinking about um, uh, what, uh, what we intend to do. So thank you, Nick. So two pieces of software, um, REDCap and XNAT, are highly relevant uh, to our research community and also uh, to NIF. Um, these are open source uh, pieces of software, have been around for many years, are trusted. REDCap is a more general, uh, software platform for uh, storing participant uh, data, cl uh, clinical data, 
um, surveys, uh, uh, managing participant IDs. XNAT is more specifically in the imaging informatics and data sharing uh, space with uh, highly technical and functional imaging capability. Uh, and these uh, these softwares are deployed at NIF partners and at our uh, client research organizations. They're great, they're highly relevant, but they're not integrated. So next slide, please. AIS Shields and is an MRFF critical research infrastructure project led by Dr. Ryan Sullivan at AIS out of the University of Sydney. NIF's a partner of AIS and a co-investor in AIS, AIS Shields. And AIS Shields aims to provide researchers that consolidated view of participant data via REDCap and XNAT integrations, quite a number of integrations, one of which includes an integration with Briar Platform's uh, Galaxy Workflow engine for genomics analysis, which is really quite exciting. So if, if we needed to make a problem statement for our incubator, user access management still remains siloed. And the proposed inc incubator at the moment is that we could augment XNAT and REDCap with trust and identity framework incorporated into AIS Shields. Next slide, please. So just to give you a contextual idea uh, of how this would work, current state is a, a researcher who's using REDCap, uh, might have a thumbnail image of a scan, uh, but to actually access the image in detail, they would need to go and log into XNAT, find uh, uh, the participant, uh, find the project, uh, and the target state for this could be that that very same user in REDCap uh, could possibly push a button and uh, launch XNAT um, in context of that project participant and session with the access control uh, set up. Next slide, please. So in terms of adoption and scalability, if this incubator is successful, um, we, we, we think there's a lot of opportunity here. And NIFs are probably most initially interested in the first of those, where we could deploy central instances of REDCap and XNAT um, uh, with the framework and AIS Shields enabled, um, but there are many other possibilities. Next step could be that our NIF partners could utilize the, the, the framework on their institutional instances of REDCap and XNAT. And then further to that, institutions, research institutions, our clients could enable the TNI framework in their red, red cap and integrate with the NIF central AIS XNAP because we're the image experts. And then it goes on from there. There's many opportunities. Not, um, and the last one is actually quite important where red cap or XNAP could be replaced with other technology stacks um, throughout our NRIs. Next slide, please. So um, I just want to uh, give you a bit of a case study, uh, the point of care MRI uh, project. This is project is uh, running today. It's a multi-site research project led by led out of Monash University. Um, if the if the technology, the framework technology was available now, this would be a great candidate for using it. NIF has supplied low field portable uh, novel uh, scanners, uh, hyperfine swoop. Um, perhaps uh, the first in the world, to four NIF nodes uh, to help researchers learn how to apply this technology for patients in acute care uh, situations needing immediate assessment and also in uh, rural uh, areas for conditions such as stroke, traumatic brain injury and other neurological conditions. So this project um, really does fit the bill. Um, it's large scale, it's multi-institutional site, multi-site uh, scanning, uh, participant identity management and naming conventions need harmonization, federated imaging data, vendor participation. Uh, there's a, a development of AI and machine learning informatics pipelines. Um, and uh, a near real-time delivery required of uh, scan data uh, from the portable scanners to the PACS environment for assessment. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, the, we believe that the trust and identity frame, framework is highly relevant to, network, uh, to the NIF network, but all, we believe also to our client research community. And we've identified two software tools for an immediate trial, um, there are numerous deployment scenarios which can aid and uplift adoption over time. This, we believe there's scope for collaboration between NRIs 
to produce shared data integrations. But we are only at the beginning of the trust and identity uh, journey. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It was great to hear from you on the opportunities that trust and identity offers for NIF. Um, and now we have our last presentation by Carl Selman, who is the CISO at Flinders University and Chair of AHEX, and he will speak about cybersecurity and national research infrastructure. Hello, my name is Carl Selman. I'm the Chair of the Australasian Higher Education Cybersecurity Partnership, of which the AAF is a partner. Um, I'm also the uh, Chief Information Security Officer for Flinders University. I've been asked to uh, prepare a presentation today around cybersecurity uh, and more specifically for, for NRI. Um, and I just wanted to um, make you aware of what is actually happening and why it's really important. Before I get started, I'd like to formally acknowledge uh, the lands on which I'm presenting to you today, which is that of the Ghana people on the Adelaide Plains. Uh, Yalaka Naglu Ghana Yakanga Imprinti. So I'd like to thank you for those uh, who have made the time today and uh, would like to get started as I only have 10 minutes. And unfortunately, I can't present to you um, face to face uh, due to other commitments. So I want to get straight to the point. Um, we all know that research, like to have great research, you need actually world class IT systems uh, through an instrumentation and infrastructure. Um, Di Obliger, who was the CEO uh, at the time around 2012, highlighted uh, this um, as she was the uh, Educause uh, CEO, sorry, um, and uh, she really elaborated on the connected, collaborative, and accessible nature of what. IT can bring to, to great research. Um, so uh, let, let's just let's just cut it through. And um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, cyber activity is definitely on the increase uh, through, and it, it's happening in a range of uh, areas and and a range of um, um, locations. Um, but more importantly, uh, nation states uh, and organised crime uh, has been on a significant increase. And right now, would be, uh, I think it's suggested that by 2025, um, it will be uh, greater, a, a greater business model and a greater uh, amount of money than uh, what uh, the whole GDP of the US is. Um, so it's a significant industry that's, that's, uh, that's growing. Um, and just to, to maybe make it more relatable to here in Australia, I'm not sure uh, if you're aware, but um, uh, the research community is specifically targeted, and that was uh, no more evident than uh, an article uh, that was brought to light in, in the Australian in 2021, which showcased multiple uh, academic researchers having links to uh, foreign recruitment programs such as the CCP's Thousand Talents Program. That was not the only one. And also, you know, if you have a look at the activities there, uh, the three month period between December 2022 and 2023, uh, we're aware of at least six Australian universities uh, that fell victim to a variety of either data breach or cybersecurity incidents. Probably the most notable was QUTs, um, where they fell victim to a ransomware incident, which actually caused significant business disruption. Um, and also, uh, just on that note, um, was only just in a briefing uh, a couple of weeks ago, where ASIO um, highlighted that it's at the highest levels of digital espionage that they've ever witnessed, um, greater than uh, war periods uh, and the like. And we've seen reflections of this uh, by federal agencies where now institutions and research centres are considered part of critical infrastructure under the SOCI Act. Um, because uh, of the importance uh, of the critical research uh, that is done um, and to the nation's sovereignty. So why specifically NRI? Well, um, there's a range of reasons here, and I've highlighted five. Uh, the interoperability for collaboration, NRI are 
designed to be focused uh, around interoperability and collaboration allows for a range of intellectual input and, and outcome use. Um, it's NRI is really, and, and those uh, that are NCRIS sponsored are uh, uh, those uh, areas that have amplified focus around specific research IP um, and uh, discipline areas. Um, so again, it's a great thematic focal point uh, for research activities. Um, the connectivity um, now is definitely expanding uh, the globe. Uh, as we see more and more Australian researchers with international research programs and often where they're leading. And similarly, um, the human capabilities that NRI are breeding, um, it's a significant breeding ground for highly skilled, capable and knowledgeable people in specific thematic areas. Um, and they're usually highly sought after, after disciplines. And um, another uh, lens is, is that balance between security versus business capabilities and often in a highly competitive world of leading edge capabilities, um, security play is, is at the expense of purpose and business function and rightly or wrongly NRI and higher education institutions in general for that matter can be perceived as easy targets. Ultimately, NRI are really sweet honeypot um, that are, is highly attractive to both nation state actors, but also to organized crime groups uh, there. So um, again, specific focus um, by the federal agencies and uh, the Australian public as a whole, uh, again, why uh, research uh, congregations or research institutes um, and uh, Australian universities are now on their critical infrastructure and uh, identified as critical uh, infrastructure identities and assets uh, through legislation. But then why trust uh, and identity specifically? Well, look, really breaks down to approximately 80% of cyber incidents and breaches actually occur through human-based digital decisions. Cybersecurity, um, really isn't an IT problem. It's actually a business problem. It's, and, and more importantly, it's actually a person problem. I mean, you think how invasive IT is um, and, and digital environments. You're using it every day, whether it be for work purpose or for, for um, personal pro purpose. Uh, everyone is using it every day. So it's invasive across. And 80% of them uh, of incidents actually account are accounted for by decisions that are made by, by people. Of these 80%, the largest are actually attributable uh, to, to gaining credentials and trust of digital accounts uh, through phishing, spear phishing, uh, social engineering, a range of activities. But really the easy entry point is just getting your credentials uh, and gaining the trust of, of there's the easiest entry point. So um, tying that in and, and for in with NRI and, and that NRI actually built on a culture of collaborative interaction between researchers, uh, it's a bit of a juxtaposition and why it's really important around this trust and identity um, uh, component. So um, we really want to create a sustainable trust and identity capability across that are intrinsically secure uh, by design. Um, and hence uh, why um, AHEX and, and myself have been a good supporter of uh, the, the program and the, uh, that uh, the AF are, are running around trust and identity, uh, secure trust and identity. So as I said, my time is pretty short today, very quick presentation, but I thought I'd leave you with a few uh, final thoughts. Probably the first is that cybersecurity isn't an IT problem. Uh, it's actually everybody's responsibility and everybody's part of everybody's business. You can't just rely on your supporting institution or the government or your IT or someone else. You actually have to take responsibility yourself. And on that vein, everyone is really accountable for being aware and understanding their responsibilities in relation to the decisions that they make. Do they click on? Do people click on this? Do they open that? Uh, do you expose yourself traveling, for example? Um, do, do you look after your, um, uh, your assets, your laptops, your, your data as it's stored appropriately and securely? 
Uh, all of these decisions are decisions that you're going to make on a on a daily basis. Do I use my my credentials to uh, connect into uh, cloud services like LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever uh, there is? Um, and also for knowing that those uh, social, social sites are, are compromised more regularly than not. I mean, LinkedIn, for example, uh, has been breached three times in the last five years um, through. So um, you've just got to take that uh, and get that understanding. Um, trust and identity isn't the only area. Um, you need to take responsibility and actually look at what else you should be considering because after all, it is a business risk. Uh, through, but it is a pretty significant one, and hence again why a, a great advocate for the work that's being done uh, for um, by the AF uh, and leading the charge around trust and secure trust and identity. But ultimately, I, I suppose I want to leave you with this: uh, don't be concerned in reaching out. Uh, this is a, a is a group sport. <laughs> there, there's not one person that knows everything or one person that can solve everything. Um, reach out to your trusted partners and the AF is definitely one of those. Um, so again, thank you for your time. Uh, short, short and sharp. I uh, only had a, a short time to be able to present, but I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, brought to bring to your attention this really important topic. Thank you. And this brings to a close uh, the presentation part of today's session. We'd just like to send a big thanks to everyone who presented today, to our guest speakers.